So, Serapia Silva asked me on YouTube, how long does it normally take me to make a perfume? It's a very, very difficult one, Serapio. Sometimes the scent comes really quickly and easily, and sometimes they can drive you absolutely mad. A great example of that is Shipra Extraordinaire, where so many trials were made that I thought in the end we'd just give up on it. So I would say generally somewhere between six months and a year, but of course I'm not working on them constantly. So Stuart Jones has said on Instagram that he is going down to the south of France, to the region around Cars, in the summer of this year, and is there anywhere that's absolutely unmissable to go? I would personally say don't go with very high expectation. Although Cars is marvellous, it really is a tourist place. Uh, all the things that you might hope you're going to see, most likely you won't, because the oil producers are factories and they're not open to the public. So the perfume museum there is fabulous. Sometimes it has great exhibitions, so I'd certainly look out for that. I would maybe go to some of the old houses like Molinard, where you can go on a tour, but really, really, you may be disappointed by what you see, because the moment you walk in, generally what's happened is they are trying to sell things to you. One thing you can look out for, which is really odd, there is a speciality bread you can buy in Kars, and it's flavoured with orange blossom. And when you eat it, it's very strange because it's really like eating a bottle of eau de cologne. Not to be missed. So It's Q asked me on YouTube, what is my favourite style of perfume and how many do I have in my personal collection? I really only ever use one scent. It's mine, Roger Oat Lux. I've worn it for years. And sometimes I might spray Great Britain, which I adore, but I never wear it. So I might put a bit on my hands so that I can, can smell it. Um, I have a big collection of old reference perfumes. I don't know how many are there, but I think it's really interesting to smell historically how people might have worked leather or a rose or a sheep. What's my favourite style? I always say if I were to describe Roger Oat Lux, it's a sheep wrapped up in cashmere. So I love mosses and woods and very dry scents, a touch of the soft sensuality of an oriental. So Big Brother Watches has asked me on Instagram, how would I describe my target customer? I don't actually have a target customer. I tend, when I make each perfume, to have a person in my mind. So I don't think of their age and I don't think of their social demographic. I think of a personality or character. And what I would say when you smell my perfumes, it is about us trying to marry the character of the perfume and the character of the wearer. I often say that when I'm standing in a hotel, staring, looking at a lift, and the lift door is like that, suddenly there's a moment when the door opens and you see the person inside. The question you have to ask when you walk in the lift, because that's all that's left, is the smell in the air. And does the smell, the scent this person has chosen, match the image they're trying to portray? So Matt Chasen asks a really interesting question on YouTube, and one that I've been asked over the years many times. And that is, if you rub a fragrance when you spray it, does it alter it somehow from a molecular point of view? Everything we do when we make a scent and the oils is try never to apply heat to the fragrance. Like with an oil that you cook with, if you heat it, you cause it to oxidize. So the problem when you rub a scent is you will cause friction and that will distort the fragrance. We call it bruising. You make the raw materials in the base come up far too quickly so a bit like a relationship with somebody, allow time. The thing will either develop into something beautiful or move on and find something new. Yanina Ochen has asked me on Instagram, what is my favourite scent on earth? I'd have to say that's very simple. It's the scent of my home. When you travel and you're away from home a lot, there is nothing more beautiful than opening your front door and subliminally knowing you're back home. Vahoosh has asked a really thought-provoking question on YouTube, which is, if I could spend the rest of my life and the rest of my working career only living in one country where I could only use the raw materials of that country, where would it be? That really is very difficult, almost impossible. I would say potentially the south of France, just by the nature of where it is and its history. So many raw materials are grown there that I could use. I like it, I like the weather, and I like the culture. Uh, I wouldn't particularly want to live there because I think I find it too hot. Maybe 
India because jasmine and sandalwood coming from there but reflecting on it no without question I'd have to say the south of France. Fred Badu asked me on Instagram if I could choose one work of art that reflects my my work and could represent my work in a way which piece of art would it be? I'd most like to say the painting that's just behind me. Uh, this work was done by a lovely friend of mine whose name was Harvey Daniels. I have about 20 or 30 pieces of art by him. Sadly, he's not with us anymore. Whenever I see it, it makes me feel cheerful and happy, and I think that's what perfume does. So I think there's a perfect marriage there. I like modernism. I like bright, clear colours. I hate dull colours and grey colours because I think life is often that way. So anything that's bright and cheery warms my soul and makes me feel great. As I just said, I hope that's what my, my creations do too. Absolute bloke, you ask on YouTube, are there any raw materials that I'm very concerned about becoming so costly or so rare over the next 20 years that they're impossible to use? The raw materials are always difficult. And I think one of the things a lot of people don't realize because we see the names and we see them readily, we think that the raw materials are readily available. If you take a material like ambrette, which I use in some of my creations, once I wanted some, I got my assistant to order it, and it took six months for me to get a little sample in just to have some journalists be able to smell. So I think lots of the raw materials are very rare. If you take my saw, sandalwood, it's extraordinarily rare. The price of that goes up 10 to 15% every year. Has done nearly the whole of my working career. It's ongoing, hopefully, I will always be able to carry on using the raw materials I love. Um, we'll see. The one thing which is an aside to your question is with the legislation of IFRA and the European Cosmetic Directive, which nobody talks about, but it's far more draconian than IFRA. They have their eye on all sorts of raw materials they might end up saying that we can't use anymore. Rose at the moment is in their sights. If that ends up happening, then I have to make the decision whether I want to carry on with my work or not. So I have to hope that things stay fine. Oliver Wraith, I hope this finds you well. He asked me on Instagram, if I could make a scent for any diva in history, who would I make the scent for? I think I'd have to say Mae West. I think so many of her quips and quotes are so fantastic that not only hopefully would she smell fantastic in it, but I hope she'd have a fantastic quip or quote to go with the perfume which will be remembered, maybe for longer than my perfume would be. JL has asked me on YouTube, do human pheromones or pheromones exist and are they used in perfume? The thing is, it's an interesting question. My answer to it would be no. Um, we have, however, I think we have to stop to think, for thousands of years known that we can make ourselves more attractive by putting certain raw materials on. Some materials, like vanilla, is what is called a psychogenic aphrodisiac. What does that mean? Psychogenic means the entire central nervous system. Aphrodisiac, something which is enhancing pleasure. So we have learned that when we put these materials on, it has a very particular effect on people. As for the idea of uh, pheromones, for me the answer is no. So Instacody asked me on Instagram, when I created Roger Oat Lux, had I set out to really make my scent? And the answer to that question is no. I had used the same scent for nearly 30 years, and one day I stopped using it because I didn't recognize it anymore. So I had to do something strange for me, which was think, how would I like to smell? So there were two perfumes that I started to use that I really liked, not made by me, but ones which were in the marketplace. But of course, I wanted something that was mine. And so I'd been working around this particular structure, which contained some of my absolute favorite raw materials. I put it on my skin, I liked it, and then thought, how do I need the scent to be so that I totally and utterly love it? And so I made this beautiful chypre, in my opinion, um, and I always describe it as a chypre wrapped up in cashmere. The perfume I choose to use is Roger Oat Lux. I never change. Sometimes I put a little bit of... Uh, Great Britain on the back of my hand, but anyone who knows me knows me for how I smell. It is a personal thing. I believe there is nothing more fabulous being recognised for the perfume you wear. So I'm not somebody who has 50 perfumes. I'm not somebody that changes from summer to winter. 
I'm not somebody that changes from day to night. In my opinion, a perfume represents your personality, and like it or not, this personality has to go with me everywhere. So, Campion Tribes 2, you've asked me on YouTube about the packaging. You particularly asked about the bottles, but I'm going to talk about all of it. Literally, if you can see it or touch it, I have been involved in the design. The bottles, I wanted to have something which was very plain and very strong, with the stopper being something which was so instantly recognisable, like the red sole on a Christian Louboutin shoe, that the minute you see our cap, if you know the brand, you know immediately that it's Roger Parfum. The silk lining inside the boxes is because when I was 18, the most decadent thing I bought, the most luxurious thing I bought, was a silk shirt. So it's a very subliminal message that my sense surrounds you in luxury in the way when I put that shirt on, it surrounded me in luxury. All the advertising images, the boxes, the presentation, all of it, I have a huge input in. Most of it I design, and I design it in collaboration with three other directors in the company um, who play a very active part. Sober Leach has asked me a question on YouTube, which is a slightly technical one, um, about process. And that is, when I made the scent of the £10 note for the Times, I put alcohol in first and then added the raw materials to the alcohol. And is that the way I normally work? Always. So I normally weigh out 50 or 100 ml of alcohol. I use 100% proof alcohol, which is the purest you can get. Very unusual. It's not usually used in the industry. And then I applied the raw materials to it. I have to work that way because so many raw materials in their concentrated form are so thick and viscous, if I didn't start with the alcohol they would never mix together, so I wouldn't know what else to add to modify the formula. So Samuel Flaherty has asked me on Instagram, what is my favourite scent that's not of my own making? I would have to say it's most likely Nuit de Noël by Caron. I have worn it every single Christmas Eve for as long as I can remember. I think the idea that a perfumer made a scent to try to capture a moment, uh, the magic, if you like, that's Christmas Eve, the promise of something that's coming, uh, I think is wonderful. And so, for longer than I'd care to tell you, every Christmas Eve, that is the scent that I end up using. A scent offering made a statement on YouTube that scent for them is a luxury that's worth every single penny. And the question they've asked me is, other than perfume, what is my great luxury? And I would say without any maybe, holidays. Um, I think they're worth every single penny. My idea of a great holiday is most likely not like most people's because I don't want to see anybody when I go away. I love laying by a pool, reading and just getting lost in my own thoughts. To say I swim is bigging it up. I must say just dip in the pool from time to time and then lay in the sun in my own dreams. It's a perfect anecdote to my normal life, which is full on and always driven by the next meeting, the next plane, the next place I need to be. Gabriel Estrada has asked me on Instagram about the difference between natural ambergris and high quality ambroxan. Uh, the difference is that just totally different raw materials. So when you take any natural raw material, you have so many component parts that make up the whole. Uh, I'm going to give you an example with Jasmine. Jasmine is made up, made up of around 900 molecular parts and behind it a hundred, hundreds of parts where we have no idea what the molecules are. That's what gives the light and shade. It's what gives the subtlety and it's what gives the nuance. And the same is true with natural ambergris. When you take a synthetic molecule, it gives a totally different effect. Not better, not worse, just different. So when you take a material like ambroxan, it gives a very specific effect. The volume of ambroxan and why you choose to use it determines the end outcome. So if you're using materials like that to substitute ambergris, then uh, it will never substitute it. It will give a different smell. Likewise, you might like to use ambergris with a little bit of ambroxan, and the ambroxan has a particular effect on the ambergris. DC Heaven, you have asked me on YouTube what is the weirdest or strangest raw material that I've ever used. And um, I'd say that one of the strangest scents that I've made was I was asked to create a scent that captured the smell of sex. 
There was a very important exhibition put on in London where things had been loaned from the Vatican and so on, which was looking at social attitudes towards sex from the beginning of time. And so I wanted to create a scent which smelt as though it wasn't what you saw or got, if that makes sense. So the first impression was this very, very proper, very fresh eau de cologne. But when you left it on the skin just for a few moments, suddenly it smelt of crotch. What I loved about the effect of it was whoever I gave it to, whatever their gender, whatever their sexuality, if I said to them, if you just wait a moment and smell it, it will smell of crotch. Everybody turned around and said yes. So I've learned something. All crotches seem to smell the same. That's open to a debate, I'm sure. But anyhow, the weirdest thing I've ever done was to make a scent that smelled of crotch. Rupesh asked me on Instagram, sometimes when I try a new fragrance, I don't like it. And then, after a day or two days, I start to discover I do. But I would say, I think it's a little bit like meeting people. Sometimes you meet somebody and you hit it off straight away, but the next few times you see them, you have very little in common. Another person you meet, and you may not quite hit it off, but you see them and you persevere, and as you get to know them, the more you understand the person and discover the person, the more you end up realising how much you like them. So maybe uh, it's through lack of familiarity, and the more you experience perfumes, and the more you continue to try to experience new perfumes, maybe you start to get a handle on the perfume more quickly. But a great perfume should carry on throughout the time you wear it, offer you something new that you discover. Sometimes I can think of scents that I've known for 30 and 40 years, and I will smell something new in them. And that's the genius of a great scent, and it's the thing that keeps the relationship you have with the scent alive. So Monty Thomas has asked me one of the most difficult questions, which is, out of all the flacons that have ever been designed and made, which do I think is the most beautiful? So, other people looking on Instagram, here's my answer. I would think it's a bottle made for Molinard called Le Baiser de Faune. It was named after uh, the work of Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe, Après Midi de Faune, and on it we see a faun bending to kiss a maiden. It's a Lalique bottle where you have the scent wrapping around the outside. 